Good morning. Good morning. What a joy and delight it is to be here this morning. My name is Jim Olson. I'm the Acting Associate Conference Minister serving the Fox Valley Association and the Chicago <coughs> Metropolitan Association of the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ. It really does all fit on one business card. <laughs> It's a joy to be here at First Congregational Church in Elgin this morning. I've been on the job as the association minister now for about 18 months, and I have just seven more churches to schedule. I'm in a different church almost every Sunday. You know, there's 44 churches of the Fox Valley Association, of which you are a part, that runs from the Wisconsin border, Waukegan, Lake Villa, uh, Lake Zurich, up that way, out here to Elgin, Harmony, Hampshire, Union, St. Charles, Batavia, Yorkville. As Paris said, I live uh, in the city of Chicago. I live on the lake shore. Um, on the, I'm surrounded by Loyola University, so everybody is an hour and ten minutes inconveniently out of the way. <laughs> It's actually not a bad place to live for just that reason, that it really is about equidistant to everywhere, and it's not bad. And I'm happy to be here this morning. I'm here for two reasons. One is to strengthen and talk about the covenant connection that this congregation and all of you have with the United Church of Christ, and to have a look around, see what's going on here in Elgin, and to represent you back out to the larger church. We're fiercely independent congregationalists, aren't we? I come from that tradition. Paris mentioned that I'm from Boston. My family, part of my family came in 1624. We owned the boat, and we came looking for the money when it was not clear that we were going to get paid. <laughs> Ancestors of mine were part of the British East India Company. And so I understand about this fierce independence, but you know, here's the other piece about being a Congregationalist. We exist in covenant with each other, this promise that God first made to us and has passed it down to generation to generation to generation that now we exist in covenant one with each other. We agree to live in covenant with the other churches of the Fox Valley Association and of the Illinois Conference, 275 congregations and the not quite 6,000 congregations of the United Church of Christ. You are part of that and I'm here to represent all of that to you and you back out to the church. My job is multifaceted. I was a parish pastor for almost 25 years before I took this position. I get to see the church at its best. I get to see those moments when you shine, when our particular United Church of Christ voice stands up and says something is wrong with our culture and must be addressed. I get to see the church at its worst when there is strife and conflict and fear, when we've circled the wagons and we no longer reach out into our communities. I get to help with that. I help clergy who are in trouble. Ministry is a lonely, isolating job. You might think that your clergy are social people and are always out talking to folks, but you know, the truth of the matter is we spend a lot of time praying for you and taking care of you, and it is a draining, emptying job. So pray for your pastors. I get to help, it's the biggest part of my job, with search and call. And I will be as Paris mentioned, meeting with the leadership of this congregation after church today to begin the conversation of transition in this congregation. There's a plan. There's a process. Times of transition can be 
full of tension and worry and insecurity about the future. And you can either react to it or you can plan for it and know that it's coming. Thankfully, Paris has given us all plenty of notice so we can have good plans in place for the coming days. I also come to say thank you. This congregation is generous with its Our Church's Wider Mission Basic Support Dollars. Not to put too fine a point on it, that's what pays my salary. And while many years go by sometimes before you need me or the association or the denomination, the time comes in the life of every congregation when there is a transition and you need the association minister to come and help with search and call. And while you're not needing the immediate help, your dollars help another congregation gives me the resources that I need in order to do what I need to do to help churches be vital and healthy. And so I come to say thank you. Thank you for your contributions to that work. Your dollars help keep the covenant alive. And I encourage you as a conversation, as a congregation, to continue to talk about what that means to be a part of the Fox Valley Association, of the Illinois Conference, of the United Church of Christ. And if you want to get involved, if you are not busy enough here, we have things for you to do. Our scripture lessons this morning have a theme. Have a theme about how God asks us to be. Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and said to them, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And as he passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen, and said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Our stories this morning talk a little bit all about that turning around, repentance, repento, means to turn around, to go in a new direction. It's easy to lose our way. It's easy to get turned around the wrong way and begin to head in the wrong direction and not know where we're going. Jonah wandered across Nineveh. Imagine a city, three days walk across. A person can walk about 20, 25 miles in a day. It's not too hot or too cold. We're 30 miles from my home right now. Three days walk would get you to Rockford from my home. Imagine a city that big. Jonah was not from Nineveh. Jonah was from somewhere else, and Jonah landed in Nineveh in a city where he knew no one. After the harrowing adventure of being swallowed by a fish, I can assure you that, in fact, men have the capability of actually sitting and thinking about nothing. <laughs> it's, it's true. Somehow we have that ability to just turn it off. I can imagine after three days in Nineveh and being swallowed by a fish, he didn't want to really see that off. Jonah was a stranger in a strange land. Jonah was a visitor to the city of Nineveh. Jonah was an immigrant. I mentioned in my introductory remarks that some of my family has been in America on this continent since 1624. Some. Some of them left just before the Revolutionary War, went back to England. They were royalists and things were not safe. And did not return until my mother's father came 
just before World War II to work for the British Home Office. My father's family came at the end of the 19th century and some at the beginning of the 20th century. And when my father's grandparents met, one spoke Italian and one spoke Swedish, and neither of them spoke English. And I remember my Swedish great-grandparents who never learned English. They didn't have to. The town they lived in, Easton, Massachusetts, had a Swedish language newspaper, had Swedish stores, the postman spoke Swedish, church was in Swedish, and I remember them. I think my great-grandmother knew more English than she let on, but it was useful for her to pretend that she didn't. My Italian grandparents on that side spoke Italian, had a different attitude about English, made sure that their children all learned English, and they learned English as bad as it was as quickly as they could. They were strangers in a strange land. They were immigrants. They saw signs that said, no Catholics need apply. They were suspect. They, like many recent immigrant groups, traveled across a big city, perhaps like Jonah, to discover a place where other people spoke their language, and that's where they settled. It was safe. Maybe they knew somebody from their village back in Italy. Maybe the others recognized somebody from Palermo or from Stockholm. And there they stayed. Each of us has a similar ancestry story, some more recent than others. Our parents, our grandparents came from someplace else. And really, my friends, unless you are full-blooded Native American, you are from somewhere else. It might not be immediately recent, but your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents came on a plane or a boat and moved here to the United States, settled in some place at first where there were other people that ate the same food, spoke the same language, had the same customs, before beginning to assimilate out into the culture. It took time. I imagine Nineveh was a bit like this. Cities don't grow three days walk across just from internal population growth. People moved to that city because there was opportunity because there were other people who had done so, and word got back, hey, it's successful. I am successful. Why don't you all come? They did. Perhaps Jonah wandered across Nineveh, recognizing that Nineveh had the same problems that big places have sometimes, that all of a sudden, folks began to be successful and then were concerned about the newcomers who were coming who might take away their success. Forgetting that a generation ago they had been the newcomers and they had had to work hard against the prejudices of the people who were there before them. Jonah saw this and at the call of God began to preach this message of repentance. Y'all are going to be in trouble if you do not turn around and recognize that we are heading in the wrong direction. And the people of Nineveh listened. Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news.
turn around. You're heading in the wrong direction. Each generation of Americans, each generation in America, we feel like we have to revisit the question. Who's in, who's out? How do we determine that? What is our national sin? Are we heading in the right direction? And my friends, whatever your politics around this might be, I want to say to you that our Christian lives calls us to be about radical hospitality and welcome, right? One of our denominational taglines, no matter where you are or who you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. That's not just here in the church, my friends. But we are called to welcome the stranger into our communities in ways that they might not expect to find. I worry. I worry about the soul of Christianity when so many are able to stand up and say, I've got mine and now you are not welcome. And in pulpit after pulpit after pulpit, this very morning in America, there will be messages like that. Maybe quite not that bluntly, but they're there. The second part of our story this morning, Jesus called Simon and Andrew, sons of Zebedee. They might have been native Galileans. They might not have been. They might have been from somewhere else. <coughs> the ancient Near East was a mobile people. We, as humans, have been a mobile migrant people. For a lot of our history, we were mobile migrant people. We followed the food. It's not until we figured out how to plant crops and build houses that we put down roots like this. I worry about the future of Christianity that is able to say to someone, you're welcome here, but Now, the best part about my job is that I get to come into a congregation and preach a sermon, and then I get to go away, and, and Lois and Paris get to deal with the aftermath. I think it went pretty well this morning. I don't know your politics. But I want to say this to you, my friends, this morning. The United Church of Christ that I'm here to represent for you this morning has a message of radical welcome and inclusivity. We are called to welcome the stranger. We are called to call our society, our government, our legislators to repent when they are preaching a message of something else. It's all very well and good for us to be comfortable in this little room and in this little community and then to go back out into the world. Remember, I come from the congregational tradition, so I know this about us. We are nothing if not polite. We don't want to be a bother. It is not in our nature to stir things up all the time. But our Christian message, our radical inclusivity, is the same radical inclusivity that Jesus exhibited all the time. Remember the tax collectors and the sinners and the women of questionable repute and the people that Jesus hung out with, that's us. And that's them. And that's who we are called to serve. As a congregation, you're entering a period of transition. It's scary. Paris has been here a long time. 
but it's an opportunity. Some of you will end up on the search committee, and I encourage you to listen carefully to all the voices who are members of this congregation. There will be opportunities and instructions about how to do that, public forums, surveys. Who are you? Who's your neighbor? And who is God calling you to be are the three questions that the church profile that you will construct is going to ask you. Those are good questions. Perhaps it will call you to a little bit of repentance to recognize that although your mission efforts have been adequate, and I don't know what they are, perhaps they're spectacular, but perhaps there's more different things you can do to reach out into the new Elgin, the Elgin that isn't sitting here just yet, to reach out with that radical hospitality that Jesus exhibited so that truly, no matter who they are or where they are on life's journey, that they are welcome here to become you. The association and the conference stands ready, happy, willing to assist with that, to guide and direct you, to help you, and it's always your choice, to choose the best new pastor for this place and this time. My privilege and honor to serve you, to serve the pastors, and to help you walk forward into a new future. Three days across the city doesn't seem so long now, does it? Amen.